Good evening. I'm Carter McDaniel, and I'm the executive pastor here at Central Assembly. And what a joy and an honor it is to be together on this Good Friday night. Good Friday services at Central are a time where we reflect on the work Jesus did on the cross and what that means in each of our lives. And even though this year's service might look a little different with the service online and you in your homes, that's still exactly what we've gathered to do together tonight. We want to reflect together on the very real, the very important power of the cross and be reminded that the joy that we feel on Easter Sunday is only possible because of the suffering that Jesus endured that we observe on this Good Friday. In the course of the evening, we will share some scripture together. We'll hear a musical selection from Central's Choir. Pastor Jim will share from God's Word, and we will end the evening by taking communion together. We also have some of our pastoral team standing by right now and throughout the service. So if at any time during the service you'd like personal prayer, just click on the live prayer button in the bottom right of your computer screen. One of us will join you in a private and confidential chat for a time of prayer together. Since we will be closing the service tonight with communion, maybe take a moment now and prepare some communion elements in your home. Pastor Jim will use a saltine cracker and a glass of grape juice, but you can use whatever you have on hand in your house. Maybe that's a cracker or a piece of bread, uh, some fruit juice, or even water. If you don't have something, that's just fine too. You can still prayerfully participate in that moment with us. You know, the cross is what really gives us true unity as believers. The cross of Christ unites us far more than sitting in an auditorium or being together a few times each week ever could. Without the cross, we're all marred by our sin. We're broken and we're lost. But with it, we're justified to right standing with God the Father. Scripture reminds us that because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, we can boldly approach God's throne with confidence. So let's start off tonight by doing just that. Join me as we pray. 
Lord, we are truly thankful tonight that in the middle of a crazy time where our world and everything in it feels shaken and unstable, the cross and Jesus' sacrifice on it remain unchanged and solid. Lord, we thank you that your blood will never lose its power. We thank you for the redemption that we can find in that shed blood. Lord, tonight we lift up the people in our world affected by the coronavirus, COVID-19. We remember that it's by your stripes, by your shedding of blood that we can be healed. And we pray for physical healing for each of those that are sick with the virus. We pray for emotional healing for families who are affected by either the disease or, or uh, the stress that we all feel at this time. May your peace and your healing prevail in each of our lives tonight. Lord, as we gather in our homes across Springfield and beyond, Lord, we invite your presence to be with us and meet us right where we are. Lord, may each of us gather tonight feel the realness of your presence with us right now. God, I pray for each person who's listening and watching tonight. Help us uh, open ourselves to the heart-shaping work that your Holy Spirit wants to accomplish in each of our lives tonight. Let us be changed by your Spirit tonight. Now, Lord, we ask your blessing on all that we say and do throughout the rest of this evening. We ask all of these things in the strong, the all-powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Mark chapters 14 and 15 recount the events of Jesus' betrayal, arrest, trial, and crucifixion. After Jesus was sentenced to death on a cross, Mark 15, 21 says, A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they, the Romans, forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Elohi, Elohi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God.
Let me add my welcome to you on this Good Friday evening service. I'm so grateful you've all joined. This for me personally is one of the most meaningful services of the year. And I'm grateful that we could at least join online. In a few minutes, we'll be taking communion together for those of you who would like to take it as we remember what Jesus did for us on that first Good Friday. That we call it good because it meant our salvation, but it was a horrible day for Jesus. But for the joy set before him, the joy of a relationship with you and me, the Bible says he endured the cross and uh, he stayed on that cross until he could pay the price for our sin. And so that's what we're celebrating today. In fact, sometimes uh, we just want to get to the celebration. And believe me, on Easter Sunday morning, even though we can't be gathered together physically in person, we're going to have a great celebration. But sometimes in our haste to get to the celebration, we skip over the suffering. So I'd like to talk to you about Jesus on Good Friday, not Jesus the resurrected Lord, but Jesus the man of sorrows. With, our, with the virus, with the crisis that our world is in right now, people are asking, like, where is God in all of this? And, and they're even asking, like, is this the judgment of God upon human beings, the coronavirus? Well, I prefer to answer with the words of Jesus himself, where in Matthew 24, verse 7, he was talking about what he called the last days or the end times. That the closer we come to the day that he comes again, just as a woman, the closer she comes to giving birth, those contractions, those labor pains become more frequent. So there's going to be like labor pains gripping the earth more frequently the closer we get to the end times. And uh, he says in verse 7, this is what some of that will look like. Nation will rise against nation. There'll be wars. And kingdom will come against kingdom. And there will be famines. And there will be pestilences. Like the locust plagues in some part of Africa right now. And the coronavirus that's striking the globe. There'll be famines. There'll be pestilences. And there'll be earthquakes in various places. But he said, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. There are going to be sorrows increasingly coming upon the world because it will be coming to the closer to the day when God will judge the world. When uh, Jesus will come, up, come back and those that have put their faith in him and, and been washed clean from their sin by his shed blood will be taken up to meet him and then evil will face its final day of judgment. And so in a way these are just signs the crises, the pestilences, the viruses, the earthquakes, they're signs of a day that is coming of God's judgment. Jesus said these will begin to be, be the beginning of sorrows. But what amazes me about what this night represents is that before Jesus, uh, before Jesus brings the time of sorrows and judgment upon our world, he himself became the man of sorrows. Some 700 years before Jesus was crucified, the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, describes his ordeal in striking detail. And he says this of Jesus in Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The one who said, there are sorrows coming. There will be judgment coming. These beginning of sorrows will be the sign that I'm coming again and I'll bring judgment. But before he brings judgment, he brings rescue and hope. And so he first of all becomes the man of sorrows. And he goes on in the next verse to say, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. This is the God that we serve. A God who's not indifferent to our sorrows. John Stott, the famous English pastor and writer, he wrote in his book, The Cross of Christ, he said, pain is endurable, but the seeming indifference of God is not. I mean, we might be able to endure pain, but what's unendurable is to think that God's nowhere near and he doesn't care. In fact, Stott goes on to say that sometimes we have this, this misconception of God, like he's just sort of lounging on a deck chair somewhere while the world wallows in suffering. I mean, just completely removed and uncaring. 
But he said, the cross of Jesus Christ smashes that misconception to smithereens. He said, we're not to see God on a deck chair. We're to see him on a cross. There in solidarity with our sorrows and with our suffering. There was Jesus to meet us at our worst so that he could bring us out and forgive us. This is the God who identifies with our pain. All we hear in the news now, of course, is the COVID-19 virus. But viruses and pandemics are not new to our world. Europe as a continent, especially through the Middle Ages, was just ravished over and over with death-giving plagues, viruses, you might say, infections that would kill people. One of the especially horrendous plagues was called the burning sickness, or people just nicknamed it the hellfire sickness. And it swept through Europe in the 10th century and again in the 16th century. It was a horrible disease. It would start with abscess scars and abscesses on your skin. And then those abscesses would go gangrenous. And then sort of like leprosy, it would eat the extremities of your body away until sometimes they'd literally fall off. There was no cure. The only place that people could find help, even though they would die, the only thing for relief from the suffering that they could go was the monasteries where the monks who had first committed their lives to Christ were willing then to risk their own lives out of love for the people that Christ died for. And in fact, the idea of the infirmary comes from the monasteries during these plagues. Well, one of the burning sickness plagues went through a, a town in Germany called Eisenheim. And there was, after the plague had finished, there was a nobleman whose family had been spared from the plague. And so out of gratefulness for what the monks had done and out of gratitude to God that his, his own family had been spared, he gave the monastery some money to commission the famous, the famous artist, Matthias Grunwald. And Grunwald painted what later has become known as one of the great depictions of the crucifixion. He painted the altarpieces in the chapel of the monastery in Eisenheim. And uh, on the left-hand side, there's these hor horrendous-looking creatures that fill the scene. And medical historians have now identified those as victims of the burning sickness, victims of the plague, victims of the virus. And across the top of that panel, Grunwald wrote the words, where were you, sweet Jesus? Where were you? And why did you not come to dress my wounds? What, what agonizing words. Where were you, sweet Jesus? Where were you? And why did you not come to dress my wounds? And then your eyes go to the center panel of that altarpiece. And there it's as if God himself, as Grunwald depicted it, God himself was giving us the answer. For there you see the scene of the crucifixion. To the left, below the cross, was Mary, the mother of Jesus, being comforted by his, one of his apostles, the apostle John. And there was Mag Mary Magdalene, just overcome with grief. On the right-hand side was a picture of John the Baptist pointing to the cross, as if to say, behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And then you look at the cross, and Jesus' body is contorted in a way beyond just, just hanging there under the weight of his own body, being tortured. And you look closely and more closely and you realize that upon his body were the scars of the burning sickness. Jesus had caught the virus. Jesus had caught the plague. The one who said sorrows will come someday to our world as a reminder that we're all accountable to God and judgment's going to come. He, first of all, became the man of sorrows himself. And he bore our sorrows and he carried them Upon himself, Isaiah said. And then in the very next verse, he says, for he was wounded for our transgressions. The Bible says that when Jesus hung on the cross, our sins were laid upon him. So he would pay the price for our sins. When he died, he dealt the death blow to sin and guilt and evil so that we could be free and forgiven and live. He, he Isaiah said, after saying he, he surely carried our sorrows, he said, but here's what was really happening. He was wounded for our sin and transgressions. He was bruised 
for our iniquities because we had sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the chastisement or the punishment that made for our peace was upon him. We deserved the punishment for our sin. But we got peace with God because he bore the punishment for us. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. What a stunning statement of truth that still rings 2,000 years later into every one of our homes into every one of our situations, into every one of our lives. By his wounds, by his stripes, we were healed. This is the God who before he came to say sorrows are coming upon the world, he said, I want to rescue from those sorrows. And he became the one who bore our sorrows with him. And so before we come to communion, would you just pray with me? Our Father, we thank you that you're the man of sorrows. That you not only talked about sorrows coming to our world, but you, you put your life on the line. And you backed up your promise by saying, I'm going to go to that place of sorrow first. I'm going to take your judgment for you so you could be forgiven. And we just ask you, Lord, to come into our lives. Forgive us today. And we pray, oh God, praise you, oh God, that you bore our sorrows and that you live to bring us life and we thank you Lord man of sorrows acquainted with grief we're awestruck tonight that you would be that kind of God and that you would meet us there in our worst to take us to your best and so we thank you and praise you in Jesus name in Jesus name now I'd like to invite you, if you would like to take communion, I will lead us in a few minutes in taking communion. If you would like to join me, wherever you are, in your room, in your home, whether you're alone or whether you're with others, if you'd like to join me in communion, we just want to give you a couple of quiet moments and prepare. If you still need to just get some juice and put it in a cup and get some bread or a piece of bread or some crackers like I have and you just want to go and get those if you have those already just hold them in your hand and I'd just like you to make these next couple of minutes just quiet moments of thanking God that he met us at his, at his worst he was a man of sorrows to meet us at our worst come now to his table as I said a minute ago you may be alone you may be with family just as my wife is here with me on the piano and we sit in this empty auditorium, stand in this empty auditorium taking communion we just welcome you if you know Jesus to take communion with us if you don't know Jesus I just invite you to say no to your sin and yes to his saving grace he, the man of sorrows, carried your sin and your grief upon himself. And if you're hurting tonight, I just invite you to let Jesus meet you where you are. For where is God when you hurt? He's on the cross where he bore your pain and infirmity. Where is God when darkness and despair seem to come in like a flood? He's on the cross where spiritual and physical darkness surrounded him as well. 
Where is God when your sin seems too great to forgive and too powerful to break? Well, he's on a cross taking your sin and mine on himself to kill it and to pour, to pour sin-cleansing blood over it. Where is God when you've been rejected and abandoned by the very people you love him most? Well, he's on a cross alone, himself rejected by the people who mocked and jeered him. But he was held there on the cross out of love for you. And so God's word tells us that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you, broken for you, broken at the cross for you. This was a night before he would walk through that sorrow and agony. But he said, I'm doing this for you. My body is going to be broken for you. So do this in remembrance of me. And so, Father, we take the bread in our hands. We break it. And we thank you that you died for us. That you met us in our sorrows, our grief, our sin, and our loss. To lift us out and to make us new. And so with thanksgiving in our heart, we say thank you for dying for us. And we take the bread in honor and remembrance of you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you take the bread with me? Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, and it's true, by his wounded body, we're healed. If you need healing right now, in the name of Jesus, let healing power flow to you from the cross this moment. Just by faith, by his wounds, we have been healed. If your heart is broken, let the healing Jesus come to you right now. If your body is sick, let the healing of the Lord Jesus flow to you right now. We thank you for it. And then God's word said, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you just take the cup and thank the Lord for the cleansing power of his blood to wash away our sin and to purchase us for himself. We thank you, Jesus, and take the cup. Thank you, Lord. 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 We love you, Lord. And now, Lord, we thank you that this table, your body and blood, represent a table of abundance for every one of us. You carried our sorrows so that we could walk in your abundance and your joy and your peace and so we commit our lives to you and we receive freely all that you have so freely given to us through your death through your passion through your sorrow thank you Lord and we praise you that we can be forgiven and made new and made alive we honor you and thank you for becoming the man of sorrows that we could be new. And we honor you and praise you. And I thank you for everyone who's joined as we have worshiped together. We just pray that each one of us, Lord, will be touched by your spirit. Keep our hearts. May your presence be very near to us as we walk with you through tomorrow. And then as we come to celebrate on Resurrection Sunday, may your grace, your life, and your presence be each one, with each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen.